we, we got Reverend Cobb in the house today, so we, I should get some amens today, right? You going to amen me? Amen. You, you got me, okay. All right. Um, <laughs> give us the word. If I give you the word, if I, what you going to say if I don't? Oh, no, we ain't going to say that. So um, I don't, I don't, um, I, I don't, I don't communicate the way that I'm going to communicate today very often. Uh, you're, I don't, I, 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 I talk about this sometimes. If you don't know this, um, man, I, I, I spend a lot of time in study. I spend a lot of time in prayer. Um, trying to, to say what it is the Lord leads me to say. And every now and then, the Lord will bless me with an opportunity to really talk from my heart. Um, and today is one of those days. I, I want to let you know today, church, that this message, although on the surface may or may not be great or good or whatever, I don't know, but I, I, don't, I don't come in here often. I said this earlier. I don't come in here often and not care what you think about what I'm giving you to eat on a Sunday. But today is a day I'm talking so much at the core of my heart. I don't care if you like it or not because it's good. Um, uh, you know, you, you, ever, you ever took somebody to eat and you knew it was good, but then they didn't say it was good. And, they, and you said, I don't care what you say, this is good. Like, that's the way that today's message is going to be. It's good because this is at the core of my heart. One of the hard things about being a public speaker and communicating, and um, this, this, this is something that's actually kind of, it's almost ironic. It, it's, almost, it's, it's almost a paradox when it comes to public speaking. The closer you get to your heart, the harder it is to articulate. Um. Talking about something that is far from your heart is easier to articulate because you rely on information. Um, it is harder to talk from the core of my heart. And that's why when I talk about things like I'm going to talk about today, it can be very difficult. Um, we're in a series called Alive, and we are um, only four weeks over our schedule. Um, and so, and we, we have one more week to go next week where we will talk to you about the spirit-filled life. And life that comes through being spirit-filled. And um, your pastor ain't afraid to talk about it. Amen? We're going to talk about it. So um, today, though, there's this chapter in the Bible. And to be honest with you, I've probably bitten off more than I can chew. Uh, this is, this is a, a lot in one chapter. And I'm only going to take you in one chapter if, if you listen to me often. Um, one complaint that you can't have about me is that I don't use a lot of scripture. Come on, somebody. Because uh, I know preachers that'll get up and read two scripture and they can spend an hour talking about those just two. But I'm going to the word here and going to the word there. But today we're going to remain in Numbers chapter 16. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. And there is so much here that I want to draw out. And, and it's really at the end where we will get to my heart. Until we get to the end, I just want to point out some things that I think are very important. And we're, gonna, we're going to navigate this story the best that we can. I've taken out as much scripture of this chapter as I can so that you can follow along um, because I don't want to, I didn't want to take all the time reading all the details of the, of the, the chapter. Um, I just wanted you to understand what was happening in the story so we could get to the very end. Uh, but we are going to go from verse 1 all the way down through verse 48 um, and we're going to look at that story. So let's start reading um, as we do uh, this on Alive. Verse 1 says, Korah, the son of Izar, the son of Koath. Now, Koath is an important name. If you have a Bible that you don't worship, you can underline it or highlight it. Uh, you can do something uh, so that you remember that name. The son of Levi and certain Reubenites, Dathan and Abiram, sons of Eliab and On, son of Peleth. How many of you guys know all these characters? <laughs> there are a lot of people that know these guys. They became insolent, the Bible says. Look at your neighbor and say, don't be insolent. It says, and rose up against Moses. With them were 250 Israelite men, well-known community leaders who had been appointed members of the council. Let's stop right there. Let me give you point number one. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on these first few. Everyone in the church ain't of God. <laughs> Can I get an amen? <laughs> Y'all met them too, huh? Y'all been around a few of them. Everyone in the church ain't of God. When, when my brother was younger, I used to give him a hard time because you could open up his drawer uh, in his room and you would pull out a Florida shirt, 
and then a Georgia shirt, and then a UCLA shirt, and then an Auburn shirt, and then an Alabama shirt, and then a Southern California shirt. And by the time you was done going through his drawer, you were more lost as who he was than you were before you started looking. Now, there are some of you in the room that are the exact opposite. You wouldn't dare have anything but a red and black shirt, right? I remember when I went, when I went to... Um, when I went to a, a, I'd a, I'd a uh, there was a starting linebacker for Georgia that was in my youth group when I was in Gainesville, and he went to play at Georgia. And while he was playing there, um, his last year, they were playing the University of South Carolina, and uh, it was a really good Carolina team that year. And he said, hey, man, he said, I really want you to come and sit with my family. He said, you know, I have four tickets for my family. He said, I really, because he had not yet invited me to come and to be a part of one of his games. And so he gave me a ticket uh, to go uh, uh, to his game, and so I went, and I was sitting um, in the stands, and I, I, I went, before I went, though, I was really concerned because I didn't know what to wear, because if you don't know this about me, I ain't about to put on red and black, all right, and so not, not, even, not even for the kingdom, all right, and so not even for ministry's sake. And so this, this was my plan. Now, this is hilarious, but this is, this is for real what I did. I, 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 had a, I had a white, an all-white Lacoste polo shirt. Now, if you don't know what a Lacoste shirt is, it was all white so that it would fit in perfectly with the color scheme of the fans. But it has a little bitty gator <laughs> right there. Come on. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And I was sitting with the fans, but I was of the enemy. <laughs> Let me tell you something, church. It's some little gators in the house. Come on. Come on. It's some people that sit here. They fit in. They look like they belong. They look like they with the team. But they got a little bitty gator sitting right here that lets us know you ain't of us. You ain't for us. You are of the devil. You are of the enemy. Come on. Those people are real. And in this story, what we see here is there was a group of people that, as Beyonce said, hate is going to hate, hate, hate. Hey, hey, was it? I done said it wrong. I done mixed it up twice. I said it wrong. Now, now I'm really embarrassed. So Taylor Swift said it. You see how much I listen to worship music. I don't listen to that <laughs> secular music. So I don't listen to all that secular music. So there we go. But anyway, listen, here's the deal. Here's the deal. Haters are going to hate. Haters are going to hate. John 15, what did Jesus say? Jesus said this in John 15. He said, if they hate me, they're going to hate you. If they hate me, he said, I'm the son of God. I'm going around healing, raising the dead, opening blind eyes, making lame people walk. If they're going to hate me, they are going to hate you. Let me tell you something. Everybody in the church ain't for you. They're not for me. They're not for us. In fact, when I, was, when I graduated college, there was a book that I read, you know, um, because a lot of us go to cemetery, I mean seminary, and, um, you know, we all go and we want to learn how to be better preachers and better ministers and all of this stuff. Um, and there's a book that was written. It was called What They Didn't Teach You in Seminary. And I read this book after I had gotten out of school and I was in ministry now. And, and one of the chapters was very interesting because it was, it was telling me that, hey, there is this 10, 10, 80 principle that happens in the church. Uh, and, and let me break that down for you. He said, and and the, guy, the writer said, he said, if you could understand the 10, 10, 80 principle, your life will have a lot less insanity. You will be a lot more sane. So the first 10%, he says, there are 10% of the people who are for you. They love you. They loved you the moment they met you. They liked the way that you look. They liked the way that you talk. They liked the way that you preach. They liked the clothes with that you wear. And it doesn't matter what you do, they are going to be with you. If I were to show up naked on Sunday and dance on the stage, that 10% is going to look on the stage and go, God bless him, he's just having a bad day. That's what they're going to say. But then there's another 10% that they, bless him, Lord. There's another 10%, they don't like you. It don't matter what you do. It don't matter how hard you serve. It don't matter how much you love them. It doesn't matter how much you try to invest into them. They're, they don't, not only are they not gonna be okay with you showing up to church naked, they don't like the clothes you do wear. 
they don't like anything about you. And that 10% is real. And then there's the 80%. And let me tell you about the 80%. The 80% of the people are, uh, the the 80% people in your life are the ones who are going to fluctuate based on your performance. When you're doing good, when you're doing something for them, they're going to celebrate you. But when you're not, they're going to talk about you. They're going to be against you. They're going to talk good to your face sometimes, and they're going to talk about you behind your back at other times. This is a moment where we read that these were people that rose up against Moses. Now, here's the interesting part about these people. These people, that these four men that we read about, led by this man named Korah, these were Levites. Now, I know for some people that are in the room, that doesn't mean anything to you. But a Levite was a priest. This, this, this was, when, when we talk church folk, this was real church folk. I mean, these were the ones, and let me tell you something that I have learned, that, that, that everyone that looks the part, sounds the part, they ain't real. Not all of them. In fact, it's been my experience in my life that some of the people in my life that were the most well-spoken people that sounded so spiritual and they looked so spiritual, they knew how to say all the right things, they know how to do all the right things at the right times, and man, they could convince everybody in the room. I'm here to tell you that some of those people, they are snakes in the grass. They are sheep, I mean wolves in sheep's clothing. That's what they are, okay? Not only that, as if that's not bad enough, as if the fact that these people that were against him, as if that wasn't bad enough that they were church people, here's the part that you don't read here, but if you look, it's telling you this without telling you this, you just have to understand the lineage. Korah is Moses' first cousin. This is family. This isn't just church, man. This runs deeper than church. And I'm sure nobody here got no family problems and some family that's bad mouths them or talks about them or hates on them. I'm sure nobody in here has that. But some of us in the room, we know what it is to have church people turn against us, people that we thought were godly turn against us. Some of us know what it is to have our very family turn against us. And this wasn't the only time that this happened. But just a couple chapters earlier, we see that Aaron and Miriam turned their back on Moses and came against him. So everybody in the church ain't of God. You need to know that. Number three, I mean, I mean uh, verse three, says they came as a group to oppose Moses and Aaron and said to them, you have gone too far. This is so interesting. This is hilarious. The whole community is holy, every one of them, and the Lord is with them. That's what these guys are telling Moses. Or this is, this, this is actually what they're saying behind Moses' back. It says, why then do you set yourself above the Lord's assembly? Point number two. This is a big one. Function with an unction. Function with an unction. And, and I know that, that y'all are going, what in the world does that mean? I'm going to break it down. I'm going to show you why this moment is so important. Unction in the Bible has three primary uses. It means to anoint. It means to understand. And it means to heal. Anoint, understand, and heal. An unction was not an anointing oil. It was an actual, it was a salve. It was a literal medicinal Item. It was, a, it was a type of medicine, if you will. There is a medicine that is needed in the church. Listen to me. There is a healing medicine called unction that is needed in the church. This is a picture of it. What, were, what, what was the issue here? They were complaining right here. This is so crazy. These guys were complaining to Moses that he put himself above them. That was their word. You have placed yourself above them. Now, let me ask you a question. Does anybody remember when Moses was called by God? Does anybody remember a moment in Moses' life 
where he actually was like, I'm going to try to be used by God. He killed the man that was being abusive to the Israelite. And then he fled and spent years in the wilderness. And then when God finds him and shows up and says, it's time for you to go and to be used, did Moses look back at God and say, yes, I'm so excited. All I have wanted to be is to be above. All I have ever wanted is to be a leader. All I have ever wanted is to be in charge. Is that what Moses said? No. Do you remember what Moses said? I don't want this. This, this is not what I want. I don't, there are a million other people that you need to use. I'm not good at this. I'm not talented. I can't speak. They're not going to listen to me. He gave God every reason in the world not to be used by God. And now you've got a group of people that are coming and saying, you just want to make everybody see you, Moses. And I just want to come. I mean, I want to put my arm around him. I want to go, Mo, man, I know that you have... You did not want this. I want to put my arm around him and say, man, I know that you have tried your best. You have served these people well. You have poured your life out to rescue them. Risked risked everything. And they still hate you. And I want to put my arm around him and say, but you know what? But God called you. God called you. Somebody in the room right now, I need you to hear my voice, but God called you. I know it's hard, but God called you. I know everybody isn't going to react the way that you want them to react, but God called you. You, 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 you can't listen to their words. I'm here to tell you, God called you. God called you. It's crazy because Korah, if you don't know what it, I, I told you to underline the, the name Koath, C O, I mean K O H A T H. This is um, letting us know that Korah was a Koathite. Now, if you don't know anything about the tribe of Libra, Levi, let me tell you something. The tribe of Levi, where these men came from, they were the priests. The tribe of Levi was breaking into, it was broken into multiple groups. There were multiple sons of Levi that gave birth to multiple tribes, even under the Levites. And he, Korah, was under the tribe of the Kohathites. Now, if you don't know about the Kohathites, that's okay. Most people don't. Let me tell you about the Kohathites. The Kohathites in their day and in their culture were considered to be the highest of all the Levites. They were the ones that everybody looked to and said you have the most important and most exciting job in the temple they were the ones that got to pick up and move the holy pieces in the temple they were the only ones that could touch them and move them they were considered to be the very top and yet still even though God had given them such a great ministry they were jealous jealousy Jealousy is a real thing the enemy likes to use in our life. And I'm here to tell you, church, instead of being jealous, what the church needs to be is faithful. Instead of being jealous, we need to understand that what God has given me to do, it matters. See, this is what the the, the leader here, Korah, when he was coming up, he was saying, man, you know what? Um, You you think you're better than all of us. And Moses is going, where did you hear that? Like, everything that I've said has been the opposite of that. And he's like, yeah, but but, but I know that, that I can do what you do. And it's like, but, but here's, the, here's the reason that we need to function with unction. God didn't call them to do what Moses was doing. God had given them a purpose and a plan and a task. And if we will just learn to be faithful, to function with our unction, to function with what God has anointed us to do and to stop looking at everybody else and saying, oh, you know, I'm jealous of so-and-so or I wish I could do what they do or whatever. Listen, you need to get over that. You know what I've learned in my life? Not only do I need to get over being jealous and be faithful, let me tell you another thing you need to do. You should just get over your jealousy and start being thankful. Because whatever God has called you to do is number one, undeserving (laughs) by me. But number two, it is an honor to serve it. I'm I'm so glad. It's it's so funny that that Reverend Cobb is here today. 
Because if any of you know this woman in our community, this is a woman that I believe with all of my heart, and, and I'm not trying to build you. I didn't know you was going to be in the room, so everybody going to think I paid you to come today so I could talk about you, but that's not what happened. This is a woman that's learned to function with an unction. She wants to serve this community and these children. And there are, I, I bet you this room is, I, I bet you, I, I, would, I would venture to say 97% of you, well, maybe not because she was at Good Friday and she talked about it. But I would guess most of you have no idea what this woman invests into this community. I would venture to guess maybe three people in this room have ever stepped out to say thank you or I see what you do and I honor it. Maybe, maybe three and I don't say that to say that you did wrong, but I'm letting you know it. The reason I'm pointing it out is to say, but she serves faithfully with all of her heart. And she understands that what I have been given to do is a really big deal. That, that, that whatever it is that God has, has purposed and planned with my life, I need to understand that there is joy in doing it. Let me tell you something about being the one that is seen. There is no joy in being the leader. There is no joy in being a leader. I will say this till the day that I die. There is only joy when I'm connected to the leader. That's it. Because as what I do, I mean, and I, I, I'm, I, in the grand scheme of things, I mean, we got coaches in the room that are talked about. We got teachers in the room that are talked about. We got community leaders, business owners in the room that are, t I, I, listen, I, I'm not trying to say that you going to understand what I'm talking about. But anybody that's been in a leadership position knows there is no joy in it. But there is joy when I connect to the leader. And I understand that I don't find my joy in what I do. I find my joy in being connected. Because listen, if we are the body, right? Doesn't the Bible tell us we are the body? Then who is the head of the body? Christ is the head of the body. So if I find, if I find my joy in being a finger, that finger is of no use. But if I find my joy as a finger, if I find my joy in being connected to the head, it is only by being connected to the head that the brain can tell the finger what to do. That is the only place there is joy. So for people, there are people I meet all the time. They, they, they want more attention. They want more thank yous. They want more influence. They want more people to listen to what they say. God bless you. All I want is to be more connected with the head. Because that's where the joy is. And what we see here is the enemy is trying to, to mess up here. He's trying to, to take people that are in one place. Let me tell you, the most frustrating and exhausting place that you will ever be in your life is when you are trying to be something God did not call you to be. Take it from me from experience. There is nothing more frustrating or exhausting than trying to be what God did not call you to be. So then it goes on. Let's, let's keep going. It's been a little too long talking about that. Verse 4 says, when Moses, yeah, we're in verse 4. We only got to go to 48. So we're, um, <laughs> thanks for reminding me. <laughs> it says, when Moses heard this, he fell face down. And I wrote this down. Maybe this is just for me. I wrote down, I said, John, when people get in my face, I need to get on my face, not back in their face. And so Moses, I, I tell everybody, man, I feel like when we get to heaven, Moses is going to be very easily recognized because his nose is going to be flat because Joker stayed on his face, man. Every chance he could get when everything, listen, I, I mean, he's teaching us something here, man. When people get in my face, I don't get back in their face. I get down on my face and I go to the one who I trust. It says in verse five, when he said to Korah and his followers, in the morning, the Lord will show who belongs to him and who is holy, and he will have that person come near to him. The man he chooses, he will cause to come near to him. Let me tell you something. This idea of God doing a separating work, there is a separation. It's real. And what, some of you are probably going, what are you talking about? I'm talking about God is going to separate the real from the fake. He is going to weed out the ones that are trying to be something that is not authentic, not sincere. It really does happen. You go read the book of Ezekiel and read about God doing that. It is, it's almost trembling to read for me. 
Because I just go, God, I just want to make sure I'm, you know, I want to make sure I'm on the right side of this thing, man. Because, listen, it's real. He says, let's skip down to, um, to verse 8 so we can go a little further. It says, Moses also said to Korah, now listen, you Levites. Isn't it enough for you that God of Israel has separated you from the rest of the Israelite community and brought you near to himself to do the work of the Lord's tabernacle and to stand before the community and minister to them? He goes, guys, aren't you thankful that God has given you the position that he has given you? You need to be thankful for that. He has brought you and all your fellow Levites near himself, but now you are trying to get the priesthood too. It isn't against the Lord that you and all your followers have banded together. I mean, it is against the Lord that you and all of your followers have banded together. Listen to this. Who is Aaron that you should grumble against him? Number three, write this down. Beware of murmuring mouths. Beware of murmuring mouths. I don't have a lot of funny stuff today, um, but uh, this preacher joke I heard, I don't tell many preacher jokes, so when I get a shot to do it, I'm going to do it. So there was this farmer, and he was riding down the road. He had a trailer. In the back of his trailer, he had a, now all you animal lovers, Lindsay, just close your ears. In the back of his trailer, he had a horse and a cow and a sheep, and the farmer had a wreck, and uh, another man pulled up on the accident, and he gets out of his car, and he hears all these terrible noises, and he goes up to the back of the trailer where all the animals are, and he looks over, and he sees the horse, and the horse is I mean, you could tell he's not going to make it. He's just doing terrible. He's in so much pain. He's making all this noise. So the guy pulls his revolver out, points it, puts the horse out of his misery. Then he looks at the cow. The cow's in terrible shape. I mean, he can tell the cow's just not going to make it. The cow's like just making all these noises of pain. And the the guy feels so bad for the cow that he's in so much pain. He says, you know what? He says, I'm going to put this one out of his misery. He pulls his gun out, puts the cow out of his misery. Goes to the sheep, same thing. Sheep's in bad shape, not going to make it. He's in so much pain. He has a choice. Do I let it stay in pain or do I put it out of its misery? Pulls the gun out takes the life of the sheep because he says, you know, I want to make sure that he's not in pain. Then he walks up to the cab where the driver is. The cab driver's looking at his rearview mirror and the gun's smoking. And the guy, he says, how are you doing? And the guy in the cab says, I have never felt better. (laughs) 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 There you go. (laughs) And so how we respond at different moments, it will matter, (laughs) right? And so it's, 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 it's these murmuring mouths, right? It's these murmuring mouths that happen in the church. I don't, I don't know if, if, if you remember this, but when we were growing up, they did this thing called washing your mouth out with soap. Come on. I can tell you every flavor, all right? I can tell you every flavor. My mom will, will attest to this. Everybody in Lincoln didn't wash this mouth out with soap. And um, I'm telling you, it's no good. And I, I, I told God when I was talking, when I was writing all this stuff down, I said, man, God, I wish you would just wash some mouths out with soap when I go through this in Jesus' name. And because there are some Christians I know that they are murmuring mouths. The word murmur is actually a, a literary term. It, it is not just a vocabulary word. It is actually onomatopoetic. Or if you know the word onomatopoeia, onomatopoetic is a word that is written down and pronounced the same way that it sounds. Murmur is a, not a vocabulary word. It is actually onomatopoetic. It is actually a, a, a description of the way that it sounds. What is a murmur? A murmur is the person, listen, y'all gonna know what I'm talking about here. They talk about things in the background, but they never have any constructive conversation. They'll talk about everything and everybody. And when you walk by, you hear the... And then you get around, hey, how are you doing, right? That's the murmur. That's the murmur. There are murmurs that happen. This is a, this, in this chapter here, this is the fifth murmur that has happened with the people of God against Moses. And before the chapter ends, you're going to read the sixth murmur. There's going to be a sixth one in the same chapter where people are actually murmuring. And listen, let me tell you something. When you hear a murmur, you better get away. Because what the murmur wants to do is the murmur wants to scatter. The murmur wants to scatter. Let me tell you, the enemy is a scatterer. 
That is what he does. We didn't get to look at Ezekiel in the valley of dry bones, but one of the things the Bible lets us know is that the bones were scattered. He likes to not just have them to be dry and dead. He wants to scatter things. He wants to scatter your marriage. He wants to scatter your family. He wants to scatter a nation. He wants to scatter the church. And I'm telling you, there is a scattering that is happening because there are murmurs. We cannot give in, we cannot give ear to, we cannot listen to the murmurs. Let's keep going, verse 12, it says, Then Moses summoned um, Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, but they said, we will not come. Isn't it enough? This is, these people are insane. Isn't it enough that you have brought us up out of a land flowing with milk and honey to kill us in the wilderness? Has anybody else ever seen this scripture? Is this crazy? They, they, they were leaving Egypt to go where? To a land flowing with milk and honey. And now they are looking back at the land of Egypt and they said, you brought us out of the land flowing with milk and honey. And you want to go where you were slaves? Are you serious? It's like last week when I was at the Disney trip with the students, with the middle school. One of my middle schoolers, he looked at me and I was trying to tell him about how awesome one of the rides that I love is the rock and roller coaster. And I was telling him how much I love rock and roller coaster and I was trying to explain it to him. And the little dude looked at me. He said, bro, he said, bro, that ain't nothing. He said, at the Columbia County Fair, they shoot a man out of a cannon. (laughs) And I wanted to look at the kid and go, you're trying to compare Disney World to the Columbia County Fair? Come on! How many people do you know they look back and they say, then, you know, man, it was funner then. I had more friends then. It was a lot more exciting then. Yeah, you were going to hell then. You know? (laughs) Let's look at the whole picture. Right? So, I mean, it's like, come on. Here, like, and then he goes on and he says, Verse 14, moreover, you haven't brought us into a land flowing with milk and honey or given us an inheritance of fields and vineyards. Do you want to treat these men like slaves? No, we will not come. So, so they say, all right, we're not gonna come. Verse 22, skip down. It says, but Moses and Aaron fell face down and cried out. This is so beautiful. It says, oh God, the God, dad, you can come on up, who gives breath to all the living things. Will you be angry with this entire assembly when only one man sins? Are you seeing what Moses is doing here? And this is going to bring us back to the end. So I want you to see this. Moses is making intercession for people that are against him. How beautiful is this moment? They're they're murmuring. They're talking bad about him. He's risked everything. He's brought them out of slavery. They're not grateful. And in this moment, he looks to God and he says, man, I just want to intercede for these people. That's why, let me tell you, one of the things that will show you the difference between churches and church people is the spirit that operates in them. Do they, spirit with, do they live with a spirit of reconciliation or do they live with a spirit of separation? That will separate people. And Moses here shows us, he says, listen, I'm going to bring back together what the enemy is trying so hard to scatter. If it would have been, I'm just being real, and y'all, y'all, y'all can play church all you want. If it had been me, I would have said, get them. Get them. You remember when you was growing up and you both got in trouble, but the one got in more trouble, he got, I said, whip him. Let all your anger out on him so that there will be none left for me, right? That's what I would have said, get him. Verse number 23, it says, the Lord said to Moses, say to the assembly, move away. From the tents of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. It says Moses got up and went to Dathan and Abiram, and the elders of Israel of Israel followed him. He warned the assembly, move back from the tents of these wicked men. Do not touch anything belonging to them, or you will be swept away because of all their sins. Listen, there is a time in your life where with some people, listen to me, you have to know how to separate. I don't like that. I don't like that. Titus 3, Romans 16, go read it. In both of those chapters, God talks extensively about people who are manipulative and divisive and not allowing them to remain connected to your life. They will suck you dry. Come on. 
Titus 3 and Romans 16. Titus, specifically, Titus 3, 10 and 11, Romans 16, 17 and 18 are the most explicit. Verse 31 that goes on. It says, as soon as he finished saying all of this, listen to this, guys, the ground under them split apart and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them and their households and all those associated with Korah lived to get, I mean, with their possessions, they went down. Listen to verse 33. The earth opens up. It says they went down alive into the realm of the dead. I watch this happen to church people all the time because of jealousy, murmuring, division, scattering. It says they went down alive into the realm of the dead and with everything they owned, the earth closed over them and they perished and were gone from the community. Division leads to death. One of the things when we talk about John 10, 10, abundant life, one of the things that has to happen is connection. You can't live an abundant life and be jealous. You can't do it. It doesn't exist You have to let go of all malice, all hate, all bitterness. Come on, somebody. You got to let go of all of it, and you've got to have a reconciliation in your spirit. And that's the only place that we can find life. But let's let's keep reading. Verse 41 says, The next day, the whole Israelite community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. Listen to this. You have killed the Lord's people. (laughs) Most, I didn't do nothing. I was interceding for them. I was on my face praying for them. They did not repent. <laughs> it says, but in verse 42, but when the assemble, assembly gathered in opposition to Moses and Aaron and turned towards the tent of meeting, suddenly the cloud covered it and the glory of the Lord appeared. Then Moses and Aaron went to the front of the tent of meeting and the Lord said to Moses, get away from this assembly so I can put an end to them at once. Now there's already been 250 Levites and four leaders. So 254 people with all their possessions and family have just been swallowed up by the ground. So Moses knows one thing, he ain't playing, right? He's then counted to two. Anybody had a parent? He's then counted to two. You better move before three, all right? He says, says, you better get away from this assembly so I can put an end to them at once. And then he fell face down. There he is back again, back on his face. It says this in verse 46. "This This is my heart. God, help me just to be able to say this so they can get it. It says, then the Lord said to, I mean, then the Moses said to Aaron, take your censer. Now, Moses is one of the key people in the Old Testament that is a foreshadowing of Christ. There is no figure in the Old Testament that is a better foreshadow of Jesus than Moses. So when the Father says, my judgment is coming on them, In the middle of the father saying, my my judgment is coming down on them right now. Moses, substitute that with Jesus, tells Aaron, take your censer and put incense in it along with the burning coals from the altar and hurry to the assembly to make atonement for them. Wrath has come out from the Lord. The plague has started. So Aaron did, as Moses said, and he ran into the midst of the assembly. And the plague had already started among the people. But Aaron, who ran to the middle, stood between the living and the dead. And he offered the incense and made atonement for them. And he stood between the living and the dead. And the plague stopped. Listen to me, church. If nobody has ever told you this, you are a priest. Number four, if you want to write it down for the sake of notes, but I'm talking from my heart right now. A real priest stands in the gap. 
A real priest will stand in the gap. A few weeks ago, I, I led a VIP meeting here that we do with our volunteers, and I read this passage, and everybody was like, man, you need to preach the whole message on that today. And I, I didn't tell anybody. I had it saved for today. But in Revelation chapter 1, verse 6, this is what it tells us that Jesus has done for us. In Revelation 1, 6, it says that Jesus had made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. He has made us kings and priests. We see it again with Paul in, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, verse 9, where he talks about that you are a priesthood, you're a royal nation. The, the word priest, if you didn't know, because it's important to understand the combination. You are kings and you are priests. Why king? Because what would be good to have any calling of God but have no authority from God? So he had to make us kings. He had to give us authority in the kingdom. So he's made us kings. That's not the focus today. He has made us priests. What is a priest? It is the same word word here that is used in the, it is the same word that is translated intercessor. Same word. It isn't somebody who's in charge. It isn't somebody who tells everybody what to do. It isn't in the one who declares everything. It is the one who is willing to go and to stand in the gap. An intercessor, if you don't know what it is, is somebody who stands between two things and makes a way from one thing to the other thing. So it is literally for us as priests, we have been given the task that we stand in the gap between heaven and earth and everything that heaven wants to do here. It is my job to stand in the gap with even those that murmur against me and to make a way for heaven to touch their life. For them to experience Jesus and all that Jesus offers their life. No, the Bible says that what they did is they actually went with what was called a censer. And this is an actual censer. This is a censer from a temple. This is what the priest would carry in those days. And what, the, what would happen is, is this censer would be filled with, with good smelling fragrance. It would be an incense censer. And the priest would go in and this would represent two things. It represented number one, the prayers being lifted up. It re represented number two, the faith of those prayers. So literally, when Moses sent Aaron in, he says, I don't just want you to go be among them. He says, I need you to go with the censer. I need you to go with a sweet-smelling aroma. How many people do you know that are in the church and they go with all the wrong aromas and they try to go up in there with everything that smells like death and they try to bring life? And God says, you got to make sure that you take something that is sweet-smelling and it's got to be the prayers and the faith of the people of God to go stand in the gap for those people so that death will not touch them. You know, it's, it, has, it has driven me crazy the last two years because over the last two years, we have been more focused about a physical pandemic than the spiritual pandemic that is plaguing our world. <laughs> we want to talk about death from corona that is nothing compared to the spiritual pandemic right now where we've got to go, man. We've got to go and we've got to stand in the gap for these people. When we talk here about revival culture, this is what we mean. This is at the heart of who we are as a church. I'm not going to be afraid to run right in the middle of the pandemic, right in the middle of the plague to bring life. I, I told this story many years ago, and I don't know if I've told it in a while, but it's one of my favorites. I have a pastor friend that is kind of a famous pastor. I won't say his name, but um, he was somebody that I was able to be around some when I was in Atlanta and spoke a lot into my life. And he was preaching in um, Hawaii, for a conference and um, he, his, 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 his eating habits were so off schedule so he would like go at like 3 o'clock in the morning to like this diner down the road because it was his time to eat dinner and he would go to this diner and he would go to this diner every day while he was there and while he was there he noticed that there were two prostitutes that were sitting there and um, he knew they were prostitutes uh, because of the conversations they would have and the way that they were dressed and he would sit next to them and 
He heard one of the prostitutes while he was having dinner uh, one night. It was 3 o'clock in the morning, and he was sitting in there, and he heard one of the prostitutes tell the other one, he said, you know, tomorrow's my birthday. And she made this statement. She said, I've never had a birthday party. And he said that, that they finished whatever they were doing and they got up and he, he went to the owner of the diner, the manager, whoever it was that was there that night. He said, hey, tell me about this girl. He said, yeah. And he went into her story about how she was abused by her parents and um, she was sexually assaulted by her dad as a young age and all this. He heard her whole story and he was like, yeah, they come in here every night at this time and all this stuff. And the, the pastor friend of mine, he looked at the guy, he says, I want to throw her a birthday party tomorrow. And the guy was like, you want to what? He says, I want to throw her a birthday party. He said, I want you to invite everybody that knows her. So the next day, the pastor gets there a little bit before the other girls. Are, he gets there when the manager tells him to get there. And he walks in, and it is a room full of prostitutes. <laughs> he said, a little awkward for the pastor. He said, um, he said that was all she had was, was prostitute friends. And he said he went in there and he said he, found, he had one of the girls tell him that she had never had a birthday cake and he didn't think about getting a birthday cake so he sent somebody out uh, somewhere real quick. I don't know how they did it or where it was or whatever but they went and they found a birthday cake or some type of a cake. Maybe it was a cupcake. I don't know. And they brought it back and, and she walked She walked in the prostitute for the birthday. She walked into the room and she just started weeping. And um, they took her over to the birthday cake and they lit the candle on the birthday cake and um, they were singing happy birthday and, and, and the girl looked at the pastor who was throwing the party for her and he, she said, can I take this? He said, what do you mean? He, she said, can I take this for a moment? He said, well, it's your cake. He said, you can do whatever you want with it. She said, I've never had a birthday cake. She said, I want to go wake my mom up and I want to show her this cake. And she took that cake and she went down the road to her mom's house and she knocked on the door and she woke her mom up and she said, look, at, I want you to see this. They threw me a birthday party tonight. That pastor led that lady to Jesus that night and after the party was over, everybody had left and the manager, the owner, whoever it was that night that was there, he said, um, he said what did you say you do again? He said, I'm a pastor. <laughs> He said, what kind of pastor are you? And he said, I guess I'm the kind of pastor that throws birthday parties for prostitutes. And I've never forgotten that. That's who we are. That's who we've got to be. I know there are, there are religious people that don't understand that mentality. But I'm, I want you to hear from your pastor's heart today. We are priests and we can't do a series about being alive without me telling you that it is your job to go and to stand in the gap. Because what I've learned in Scripture is sometimes they don't need to touch Jesus. They just need to touch something that is touching Jesus. Do you remember the story with the woman with the issue of blood? She never touched him. She touched the hem of his garment. Now, for some people, they read right over that. I, listen, if this is God's conversation with humanity for all of history, I think every word probably matters. Why would God point out that she touched the edge of his garment to show us as the priest that as long as they touch something that is touching him, they can be healed? That's us. If we are believers in Christ, that's us. But there are some of you in the room that, that you don't know Jesus. We want to stand in the gap for you today. In fact, every single day, every Sunday morning, whether I'm away or whatever, this past Sunday I had to be at the school at 7.30 to, for senior breakfast and speak over there. You know what I did before I went there? I came over here that morning, even though I wasn't going to be here for VIP or nothing else, and I laid my hand on every one of these chairs, and I prayed over every one of them. I'm doing it every single Sunday. Because somebody's got to stand in the gap. And I'm going to stand in the gap for you. I'm here to tell you that, the, that, that what we see Aaron do here is a perfect picture of what Jesus did for you. That in the middle of the plague, he ran right in the middle of the plague and he stood between the living and the dead and he died and gave his life for you. And you can put your faith in that and find him today. But also that we might be the ones that stand in the gap. I wrote down a list if you want to put it down. Here. Who do we stand in the gap for? We stand in the gap for the lost. 
We stand in the gap for our brothers and sisters in Christ who are in need of prayer. And we stand in the gap between generations. We got to stand in the gap so that God can make himself known, experienced, and that his life might come through us.